Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, Strengthening C12 with Seth Klein. Um, Sustainable Milton is a grassroots organization, right? We're a nonprofit community organization with a focus on making Milton a healthier, more adaptive, resilient, and ultimately more sustainable community. We aim to achieve this through education, local action, and collaboration with like-minded organizations, the community, private businesses, and local government. My name is Marcia Smith. I'm the chair of Sustainable Milton. I've worked for many years in the environmental sector. I've, I'm an environmental scientist, an analyst, an educator, but tonight I join you as a mother and a concerned Canadian. So tonight we're excited to have Seth Klein um, introduce us to his book, A Good War, right here. And I'd like to introduce my co-host. Sorry, she's gonna be the moderator for the rest of the evening. Her name is Efreen. Now, Efreen works in the nonprofit sector and is an event coordinator, educating various demographics on climate change awareness, sustainability initiatives through program design and delivery. She currently sits on the board of Sustainable Milton and co-leads the youth engagement and education team. Efreen? Hi, thanks, Marsha. I'm really excited to be here tonight to hear from Seth Klein and to learn more about Bill C-12 and the collective effort that's needed across all divides to advance bold action. So I'd like to introduce uh, Natalie, who is my youth engagement co-lead and my fellow board member. She is a grade 12 student um, who is currently attending Bishop Reading High School, and she's going to share our land acknowledgement. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yep, Natalie, we can hear you, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead. It says my connection is unstable. So if I cut out, feel free to, um, to take over. So, Okay. As a community, we have the responsibility to honor, care for, and respect all the creation gives to provide us with life. This includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. The Anishinaabek peoples have utilized this land for millennia, and we would like to acknowledge their direct descent, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land, upon which we live, work, and connect ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty relationship and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which include the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee. Since European contact, this land has, and continues to become, Uh, so I will just finish off for Natalie because I think she's having some internet issues. So since European contact the lands and continues to become home for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, agreement whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals, and each other in the interest of peace and friendship and for the benefit of not only ourselves, but to our future descendants. So as we pull up the next slide, um, I would like to introduce Kim, who is another member on the Sustainable Milton's Government Engagement um, Board. And she was motivated by Seth's book that she went straight to work organizing this event and convinced that she would not only uh, be moved to action by a good war, and she is here to tell you a bit more about Bill C-12.
Thanks, Afreen. Well done, ladies. I want to welcome everyone to this evening. Thank you for joining us. I wanted to start out by saying that we are happy that we have Bill C-12. And the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act is something we desperately needed. Unfortunately, it's not quite as strong as we need it to be. The issue that many experts are pointing out is that it doesn't have a 2025 deliverable for starters, and it doesn't have any of the rolling deliverables that we were hoping to see. Next slide, please, Marcia. Thank you. Most importantly is an equitable transition. This is a quote from another organization that is working very hard to strengthen C12, 350.org. We're calling on MPs from across political parties to come together and amend the bill so that it works for people with a whole of government approach to climate action that listens to science, respects indigenous rights, creates climate jobs and leaves no one behind. That's what we want from C12. Next slide, please, Marcia. These are the five pillars of a robust accountability law. I'm not gonna go through them, but I wanted to point them out because CANRAC has done some amazing work and I wanted to give them a shout out for all of the hard work they've been doing in trying to raise this issue. Next slide, please, Marcia. So this is where it gets nitty gritty. On the left, you'll see the areas that we feel are weak. And I shouldn't say we, it's actually the experts that are saying this and we are articulating it or re-articulating it here. What we want to see is more um, ambition for, first of all, we want a 2025 deliverable, not a 2030 deliverable. We currently don't have any um, accountability cycle that's aligned with the Paris Agreement. There's no mention of carbon budgets. The advisory body is subject to the Minister of the Environment or another minister reported by the governor in council. And there's no formation of a, a nonpartisan whole of government approach. There's no mention of indigenous peoples, their rights or avenues for participation in the accountability processes. There's no mention of a just and equitable workforce transition. And what I have heard is that it will be good for the pulp and paper sector because all the plans and assessments and reports are going to be huge. So we know that we need to strengthen C12, but how do we do that? When I read Seth's book, I was immediately moved to action, to be honest. I was so impressed with the way that he wrapped up how Canada approached World War II and could mobilize very quickly and achieve incredible results. So I am pleased tonight to welcome Seth and I have the honor of introducing him. Seth is the team lead with the Climate Emergency Unit, which is a project of the David Suzuki Institute. He served for 22 years as the founding British Columbia director of the Canadian Centre for the Policy Alternatives. He's a public policy research institute committed to social, economic, and environmental justice. He also serves as an advisory board member for the Columbia Institute's Center for Civic Governance and is a frequent media commentator on public policy issues. Tonight, he's going to tell us all about his book, A Good War. And Seth, with that, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, very, thank you, Kim, for that introduction. Am I coming through okay? Perfect. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And, um, and thank you all for your interest in joining this event and for making time in your, after a busy day when I'm, I'm sure you've been on a lot of Zoom calls already. Um, and thank you so much to Sustainable Milton for this, this invite. Uh, I'm joining you with gratitude from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, otherwise known as Vancouver. And I've been asked to offer some opening comments about the book and then a little bit about uh, Bill C-12, and, and then we'll have lots of time for discussion. This is, this is my book, by the way, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. It's my belief that my book calls on us to adopt an entirely new and different approach to the climate crisis than the one that we've pursued to date, 
The book endeavors to tell the truth about the severity of the crisis we face, but ever since it came out in September, I've had lots of feedback from people and people are telling me that they find it an unusually hopeful book and I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, the book's original twist, as, as the title suggests, it is structured entirely around lessons from the Second World War. Let me just say right off the bat that there's no small irony in me coming to this place. Uh, and like a lot of you, I suspect, I also wrestle with the war analogy. My, my own political activism started as a teenager in the peace and disarmament movement in the 1980s. I'm actually the, the child of Vietnam War resistors. That's how I happen to be Canadian. But I'm now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society and galvanize our politics and to fundamentally remake our economy. And here's why I'm just going to share uh, a chart with you. There you are. I hope you can see it. Um, and, uh, and what you see in this chart is really, to, for me, that what we have been doing in response to the climate crisis so far is simply not working. Um, if you look at Canada's greenhouse gas emissions going back the last 20 years, as you see in this chart, what you basically see is a plateaued line, meaning emissions are no longer climbing, but neither are they in decline. After all the decades of calls to action, our emissions are not on a path to stave off a horrific future for our children and future generations. This is important context for the discussion about C12, because this chart comes after ratifying Kyoto and after so many pledges and promises, um, and yet there, the record really speaks for itself. We've run out the clock with distracting debates about incremental changes, but where it matters most, actual GHG emissions, we've accomplished precious little. So here we all are, you know, all of us who pay attention to uh, what the science says, confronting this harrowing gap between what that science says we have to do and what our politics seems prepared to entertain. I didn't actually start off planning to write a war story. The, the book project began as an exploration of how we can tackle that gap, how, how we can align our politics and economy in Canada with what the science says we urgently need to do. Um, and the book does do that. But initially I had planned to include only a single chapter on lessons from the Second World War because I'd long been intrigued uh, by World War II as an example of rapid economic transformation. But as I delved into that research, I began to see more and more parallels between our wartime experience and the current crisis, and ultimately decided to structure the entire book around lessons from our wartime experience. Because I see in that history, this helpful and in fact hopeful reminder that we have done this before. We have mobilized in common cause across society, to confront an existential threat. And in doing so, we actually retooled the entire economy twice, in fact, once to ramp up military production, another time to reconvert back to peacetime, all in the space of a few short years. And so the book explores what wartime scale climate mobilization could actually mean and look like. Each chapter jumps back and forth in time uh, between stories of what we did in the war and what we now face. And in those comparisons answers questions like how has public opinion rallied to support mobilization during the war? How could it be galvanized again? What was the role of government, the news media, arts and culture? How was social solidarity secured across class and race and gender? And can we do so again now? How was national unity established across Canada's many provinces with all of their different interests? Um, and can we achieve that again as we move off fossil fuels? How did we marshal? all of our resources to produce what was needed. How do we do that again? How did we pay for it all then? And, and can we mobilize the necessary finances again? Interestingly, what supports were offered for returning soldiers? And is there a model there for just transition for fossil fuel workers today to speak to the just transition point that Kim was mentioning off the top? What was the role of indigenous people in the war? And what is it in today's transformation? What about the role of youth and social movements then and now? But importantly too, while most of the book, you know, lauds what Canada did in the war, there are a couple of chapters there that dig into the war's cautionary tales, the, the warnings of things that brought us shame, the internments, the squashing of civil rights, the poisoning of indigenous lands, perhaps most apt to the current crisis, the response to refugees, 
So those things that we don't wish to repeat as we now mobilize for this current crisis. And running through the book is this question of what sort of political leadership we require to see us through challenges like this. And I wanna start with an important comparison I made near the beginning, because it gives me some hope and it's this, which is that despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it's worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders and, and actually much of the public was reluctant to recognize what would ultimately be necessary. A lot like today, I think. Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience, yet right up to the 11th hour, our government and much of the public still hoped to avoid getting dragged into that fight. And I feel like that's where we find ourselves again today in this, this awkward period where two summers ago, the federal government passes a, a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons one day, and then proceeds with reapproving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion the very next day. That's a dynamic that I refer to as the new climate denialism. It's, it's a concept I unpack in the book, but I am convinced that as with the Second World War, this phony war period isn't gonna last. In fact, that it's about to end. Ever since releasing my book in September, I, I've now given a lot of talks like this, done a lot of interviews, and invariably I get asked, how do you know when a government gets the emergency? Or any emergency, really? And um, in answering that question, I've had to distill this 400 page book into what I call my four markers of when you know that a government has shifted into true emergency mode. And when I'm done talking and we're in discussion, I'll, I'll pop a, a, an article into the chat, a link to an article where I summarize these four markers. But here they are, the four markers of emergency mode when you know that a government gets it. Number one, it spends what it takes to win. Number two, it creates new economic institutions to get the job done. Number three, it shifts from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures as needed. And number four, it tells the truth. It tells the truth about the severity of the crisis and communicates a sense of urgency about the measures necessary to combat it. And during the Second World War, the Canadian government did all of those things. And likewise, I would actually say in response to the pandemic, the Trudeau government passes all four of those markers. But with respect to the climate emergency, so far anyway, neither our federal government nor any provincial government of any political stripe hits any of those four markers. So I wanna explore a little bit about more about each of those markers with you and, and offer a couple other key lessons that I draw from our Second World War experience. In the book, I, I group all of these lessons into what I call the battle plan for climate mobilization. It's a 14 point plan outlining what it looks like to adopt an emergency mindset and do what it takes to win. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through all 14 points. That would take too long, but I wanna highlight a few, starting with those four markers. So marker number one, spend what it takes to win. Uh, a benefit of an emergency mentality is that it forces governments out of an austerity mindset. This year, in response to the COVID pandemic, Canada's debt to GDP ratio is going to rise from about 30% to 50%. Now, that's a big jump in a single year. But at the end of the Second World War, it was more than double that. It was well over 100%. And when C.D. Howe, who C.D. Howe was the minister in the Mackenzie King government who oversaw all of the military production and um, uh, he really oversaw this tenfold increase in federal government spending during the war, and when he was pressed about government spending, he famously replied, if we lose the war, nothing will matter. And in order to finance that war effort, the government issued new public victory bonds and new forms of progressive taxation were instituted, including, by the way, a cap on profits. The, the kind of profiteering that we've seen in this pandemic was illegal in the Second World War. As we confront the climate emergency, we're gonna need to finance the transformation employing similar tools. Unfortunately, however, federal spending on climate action and green infrastructure so far pales in comparison to both the war and the pandemic response. Just to give you one example, ever since the first lockdown a year ago, the Bank of Canada has been buying up federal government securities in order to finance the emergency response to the tune of $5 billion a week. It's been extraordinary. In contrast, the Trudeau government is spending on the climate emergency about $5 billion a year. Interesting comparison. So the Trudeau government isn't 
spending you know, a little less than it should in the face of the climate emergency. It's spending less by a massive order of magnitude. Marker two, create the economic institutions needed to get the job done. During the Second World War, starting from a base of virtually nothing, the Canadian economy and its labor force pumped out a volume of military equipment that's simply jaw dropping. So during six year, those six years, with a population less than a third what it is today, Canada produced 800,000 military vehicles, more than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined. 16,000 military aircraft, ultimately building the fourth largest air force in the world at the time, and about 700 ships, all from a base of virtually nothing. I'm just trying to give you a flavor of the speed and scale of what we did when we were serious about an emergency. And remarkably, the Canadian government, under the leadership of C.D. Howe, established 28 new crown corporations to meet that wartime production effort. How was this fascinating character to me? He, he was no lefty, by the way. He was on the right wing in the Mackenzie King government and had made a lot of money in the private sector, but he was seized with this task uh, and he was in a hurry. And any time the private sector couldn't quickly do what needed doing, he created another crown enterprise to get the job done. He also undertook detailed economic planning to and coordination of supply chains to ensure that wartime production was prioritized. And similarly, I would say during the pandemic, we've witnessed the federal government create these audacious new programs like the CERB and the wage subsidy with a speed that I certainly wouldn't have predicted. But in response to the climate emergency, we've seen nothing of this sort. So in contrast to C.D. Howe's wartime creations, the Trudeau government in its time in office so far has created two new crown corporations, the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And I hate to tell you what the second one is, it's, it's the Trans Mountain Pipeline Corporation. It's the one that makes us all the proud owners of a 60 year old oil pipeline from Alberta to my province. If our government really saw the climate emergency as an emergency, it would like C.D. Howe did quickly conduct an inventory of all of our conversion needs and determine how many heat pumps and solar arrays and wind farms and electric buses, you name it, we're gonna to need to electrify virtually everything and end our reliance on fossil fuels. And then it would establish a new generation of public corporations to ensure that those items are manufactured and deployed at the requisite scale. The third marker, shift from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures. I showed you that chart earlier showing that for the last 20 years, our greenhouse gases ha have merely flatlined. Why is that? I think, it's because when you, when you survey all of our federal and provincial climate policies to date, what they all have in common, almost every one of them, is that they're voluntary. We encourage change. We incentivize change. We, we offer rebates. We send price signals. What we have decidedly not done is require change. If we're now going to meet these GHG targets that we have to meet and that we need to embed in C12, we need to set clear near-term dates by which certain things will be required. For example, we would declare that it will no longer be legal to buy a new fossil fuel burning vehicle as of 2025. We would mandate that all new buildings will not be permitted to use natural gas or other fossil fuels for heating as of next year. We would ban the advertising by, by fossil fuel vehicles and gas stations. That's just like we did with cigarettes. That's how we would make clear that this is serious. Which leads me to marker four, tell the truth and rally the public at every turn. Many people assume that at the outbreak of the Second World War, everyone understood the threat and was ready to rally. That's not true. It took leadership to mobilize the public. In frequency and in tone, in words and in action, the climate mobilization needs to look and sound and feel like an emergency. And the leaders we best remember from the Second World War were outstanding communicators who were forthright with the public about the gravity of the crisis, and yet still managed to impart hope. And their messages were amplified by a news media that knew what side of history it wanted to be on, and by an arts and entertainment sector keen to rally us. Similarly, we've all witnessed the government model this kind of emergency communications this year through the pandemic, right? The messages are ubiquitous. We receive daily press briefings. We hear regularly from health officials. The media has taken seriously its duty to provide necessary information on a daily basis. Government leaders in the media have listened to health experts. None of that consistency and coherence, however, is present with respect to the climate emergency. And when our governments don't act as if the situation is an emergency or worse, 
when they send contradictory messages by approving new fossil fuel infrastructure, they're effectively communicating to the public that it's not an emergency. And so for those leaders who get that we face an emergency, they need to act and speak like it's a damn emergency. That's what you do in a crisis. I wanna mention two other lessons. One is that inequality itself is toxic to social solidarity and mass mobilization. There are a lot of climate policy purists out there who say, you know, don't link the, the struggle of taking climate action to, to tackling inequality or all these social justice issues. You know, don't make it any more complicated. It's hard enough as it is. I think they're wrong. I think they're wrong, first of all, because these issues are intricately, int intimately linked. The, the richer you are, the higher your emissions, the, the poorer you are, the more vulnerable you are to climate change. But we also need to link these issues because that's how we win. A successful mobilization requires that people make common cause across class and race and gender. And, and that requires social solidarity. In the first world war, inequality had undermined that. It had actually undermined recruitment efforts. And so the King government, understanding that, took bold measures to lessen inequality and limit excess profits. We're gonna need that again today. And I, and I see an echo of that in the appeal, the great public appeal of the Green New Deal. Polling that I conducted for my book research reinforces this, that when you link tackling climate to tackling inequality, support for that bold climate action doesn't go down, it goes through the roof. And the last lesson I wanna to offer today is, is one that uh, you heard off the top from 350. It's a, it's a key wartime lesson, which is that you leave no one behind. And for me, that comes down to the issue of jobs. Um, you know, uh, there are about 200,000 Canadians who are currently directly employed in the fossil fuel industry. It's a lot. We need to offer them something. We need a real just transition plan. But just to put that figure in context, in the Second World War, Canada was a population of about 11 million people. Out of that 11 million people, over a million enlisted into military service, and more than that were directly employed in military production. All of those people had to be recruited and trained up, and after the war, reconverted, reintegrated into a peacetime economy. And the government did that with these incredibly audacious programs of income support and housing support, post-secondary training programs that completely transformed the face of the post-secondary sector in Canada and changed the lives of thousands of people. If we could do that then, we can do it again. I've also been asked to share some thoughts on the proposed C-12 bill, and I'll, I'll just offer a few thoughts and then we'll open this up. Um, some of you may have seen this piece I wrote for the National Observer back in January. This federal climate accountability law, as it's called, I, I think is unlikely to hold anyone accountable without significant amendments. And we need to mobilize to press for that to happen. As you saw in that chart, Canadian climate policy is this disheartening trail of unmet targets. And, uh, and, and now we need, to, we need to change that. So in the last election, the federal liberals promised a new law to rect rectify that sorry record. And in last November, the Trudeau government tabled its long awaited bill seeking to embed new greenhouse gas emission targets into law. The bill, sadly, though, C-12, its, it's official name is the Canadian uh, Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, provides virtually nothing in the way of robust accountability. And in its current form, it, it's very disappointing and, and desperately needs amendments. The good news is that in a minority parliament, the government needs the support of one, either one or both of the NDP and the Bloc Québécois to pass it. And that means there exists a, a small window of opportunity to amend the proposed law and turn it into something that can indeed induce significant climate action. So if you've ever wondered when you might wanna contact your member of parliament and share your thoughts and hopes, and you're concerned about the climate emergency, uh, well, right now, friends, would be a very good time to do that. Um, and, and you know, there are, no, there are worthy things in this bill, as Kim said off the top. The Liberals uh, had promised in the election that, that they would embed a law committing Canada to achieve net zero GHG emissions by 2050, and that is in this law. Uh, the problem, of course, is that 2050 is 30 years from now, when no one currently in federal politics will still be there, and if you don't mind my saying, a number of them are no longer going to be with us. So understanding this, the, 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 the Liberals additionally promised uh, that they would bring in new legally binding five-year 
milestones to reach that target. Now, here's the bad news. The first of those promised five-year milestones currently proposed in C12 isn't, as you might logically expect, five years from now, but rather in 2030. Now, 10 years is a lifetime in politics. More importantly, by 2030, we need to have truly bent the curve on our GHG emissions or we're fried. That's why the milestones, if they are to be meaningful and accountably track our progress, they have to start sooner and, and, and ideally come more frequently. Um, and we also need that 2030 target to be much more ambitious, whereas C12 merely aspires to vaguely exceed the current 2030 target that the Harper government brought in. So Kim outlined quickly a, a number of amendments, but uh, just to highlight the key one, we need the first milestone target to be 2025. And better, additionally, I would say, we need rolling, I would say, three-year carbon budgets. So in the same way that we have rolling three-year fiscal budgets, which was actually a terrific liberal government innovation in the 90s, we need rolling three-year fiscal budgets that diminish over time and ensure that we hit those newly ambitious 2030 and 2050 targets that we embed in law, but where a government can be held accountable within the life of a mandate. Um, we need a federal commissioner for the environment who's truly independent, uh, an independent officer of the parliament, or establish a new parliamentary carbon budget officer, something I've long called for. NDP MP and Environment Critic Laurel Collins has been pressing for a number of these amendments. The Greens have made it clear they will not support a bill without major changes, but they only have three votes. And we hear that some backbench Liberal MPs have been voicing the needs for change. That's great. Um, the draft bill is going to be going to committee sometime in the next few weeks. We don't know exactly that they, they haven't put a date in the parliamentary calendar. Um, we hear that the minister so far, while he's open to a number of amendments, he's not willing to get a date in there before 2030. So this is the moment for NDP and Bloc MPs to use their influence in a minority government. Um, and for Liberal MPs who ran on climate to make their voices heard. We need them to exercise their political muscle as this bill needs to be much strengthened. And all of us who want a real climate accountability uh, plan need to make sure all of our MPs know how we feel. We need to demand a, that that committee date be scheduled uh, and that we legislate an earlier time frame than 2030. Um, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna leave it at that for now. I might share a final thought just as uh, before I leave you at the end of the hour, but let's open this up for discussion. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you, Seth. It was so great to have you here tonight. And it's really interesting just to hear the history that can be applied to the current climate crisis. Um, just so that the audience knows, I already see a lot of engagement in the chat, which is amazing. Um, if you have any questions that you want Seth to answer, please put it in the chat box. Um, and for now, we'll do our opening questions. So Seth, um, we heard that someone sent a copy of your book to every member of parliament. Have you had any feedback or reaction from them to your book? And is there a pol political or other Canadian leader you think could be the climate emergency CD how? <laughs> um... Well, on the first of those, yes, I was giving a webinar like this a few weeks ago, and uh, a woman from Kingston actually uh, saw it and then um, bought the book and then contacted me, and she's purchased 338 copies of the book for every MP. It's an extraordinary generous offer. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, it's a pricey commitment, even with the, the publisher's discount. Um, so, uh, and those have just, are, they're just being delivered uh, this week into the hands of MPs in Ottawa. So um, they haven't got them in their hands yet, but they will by the end of the week. So, so now, now that people know that, uh, everyone can follow up with their own MP uh, in the next week or two and make sure that their MP, uh, um, you know, cracks it open. Um, and in terms of, uh, you know, who the CD Howe is, I like, that's a great question. Um, by the way, it gives me great satisfaction that it, over the, after the Christmas holidays, I, I actually heard from three great grand, three grandchildren of C.D. Howe. The book was circulating in his family, and they really like it, um, and that that made me very happy. Um, I don't know yet. 
I don't, we haven't seen that person seized with the task, federally or provincially. Um, there's a few, you know, interestingly, CD Howe was an engineer by training. It'd be interesting to, to know maybe there's an engineer out there. Um, I guess I would simply say it's not too late. You never know when these people will step forward. If you, if you had asked Canadians in 1938, you know, this gang of Mackenzie King's cabinet, do they have what it takes to completely transform the Canadian economy as they were about to do? I'm certain most Canadians would have said, nah, not this gang. And if you had asked me a year ago, if I thought there were people in Finance Canada at the Bank of Canada able to so quickly pivot and create these audacious emergency responses we've seen, I hate to say it, but I would have said, no, there's no one home who thinks that way. And I would have been wrong. So the, the door is open for that new CD how to step through. I agree. I agree. I think it requires someone with great passion and leadership to do that role. I also think sometimes it can be an appointee, like, um, you know, I listen uh, to the south of us, the Biden administration has appointed some fantastic people. And if you, you know, John Kerry for, as the international climate czar and the domestic climate czar um, uh, uh, is this woman, Gina McCarthy. If you listen to an interview with her, she, she is incredible. Um, and when I listen to an interview with her, I'm like, man, we need one of those. Um, and we don't have one, but a government could appoint them federally and provincially. Yeah, that's true. I actually am not familiar with that person. So I'm gonna definitely look that up after this, uh, after this webinar. Um, looking at the questions, we have so many coming in. So people are very interested to hear your perspectives. So the next one is, what would motivate people to accept the necessary, necessary changes to reduce carbon emissions? What would motivate people? I mean, so here's the interesting thing. Um, the polling that I conduct, I interviewed a lot of politicians and political insiders as part of my book research. And I, only, I wasn't interested in interviewing climate deniers. I only wanted to interview people who, who claim, you know, who I, who I genuinely think get the science and yet whose governments and parties are not pursuing an agenda that aligns with what the science says we have to do. And when you press those folks, you know, the, they always fall back, all of them fell back on some variant of the rejoinder, well, you gotta meet the public where they're at and they're not there. Now, that, I found that a frustrating response and that's why I commissioned this original poll from Abacus Data to see if that was true. And what I found is that it wasn't true. What I found was a, a public that is in fact ahead of our politics in terms of their understanding of the emergency and their willingness to embra embrace and accept much more ambitious climate action than what any federal or provincial government has so far offered. Um, they're waiting for it, they want it. We saw that momentum building right up to the point of the pandemic with these incredible mobilizations of, led by the student strikers and with the Wet'suwet'en solidarity responses and so on. People are, were ready for it. It was one of the top issues in the election. But I also think, you know, this is why marker three, by the way, I put in the chat the link to my four markers article. So marker three is moving from voluntary to mandatory. I think this partly why that's so important and it has an echo in the pandemic, right? Uh, most of us wanna do the right thing. We want to convert our homes. We want to change how we drive. We want to do what we need to do to lower our emissions. But it irks us that, it, to think that we'll do it and our neighbors won't because nobody wants to be a chump. Right. Um, this is the benefit of adopting mandatory measures is you don't need to worry about your neighbors. Everyone's going to have to do it. And you saw this in the pandemic, right? Where the, again, the public was ahead of our politics saying, make mass mandatory. I don't wanna to have to do this alone. Make everybody do it. It's the same with climate. Right, that's actually so true. That's a great comparison that I hadn't originally thought about. So when, I, I'm actually just curious about when you were doing your polling, you said that you had only spoken to people whose agendas or were you know, more oriented to the climate uh, science. Um, how would you go about getting climate deniers on, 
on the climate change plan and to actually have climate action and participate? It's a good question, except my answer is I'm not worried about that. Oh, really? here's, the, here's the good news about the poll. Okay. Those who hold, you know, out and out, you know, climate denial views, who don't accept the reality of climate, of, uh, you know, the scientific reality of human-induced climate change, are a diminishing rump of public opinion. They don't matter that much. The far more troubling um, thing that we're up against, and the one that I'm trying to tackle in the book, is what I call the new climate denialism. Because this is what all of our governments practice, and it lives in all of us to a certain extent, which is to say that you get it and accept the science, and yet not practice not pursue an agenda that aligns with what the science says we actually have to do. And, and this is what distinguishes our current leadership from the leadership we had in the Second World War. That the, the point is, is that when you actually recognize an emergency and you are a leader, your duty is to um, be forthright about the crisis and what we have to do to actually lead. Um, and that, that's what's been missing. So, you know, it does it does it annoy me that there's still climate deniers out there you know traditional climate deniers yes but i'm much more worried about the new climate deniers hmm. that's an interesting perspective and just to expand on that another question that was submitted is um, what role do corporations play through this process and what proportion of the burden do corporations bear in relation to the government well we all need to get to, to zero to carbon zero, including every corporation, every industrial sector. Um, this is also where I had some fun with these World War II comparisons, right? The private sector had a huge role to play in the Second World War and all of that production of military equipment and so on. But here's the thing, what they didn't get to decide, what the private sector and the market didn't get to decide was on the allocation of scarce resources in, because that in an emergency, we don't leave that to the market. Right. Let me give you an illustration. Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1941. Two months late and the U.S. entered the war. Two months later in February of 1942, a mere two months later, the last civilian automobile rolled off the assembly line in Detroit. And for the rest of the war, the sale of civilian automobiles was illegal. Now all of those plants were very busy. Um, pumping out military vehicles. But none of that transformation happened because of the goodwill of patriotism of the big three automakers. It happened because they were ordered to do it, right? That's why we need to bring that direction. We need to, that's why embedding stuff in law is so important. And it also means that, that when the private sector, for whatever reason, isn't quickly doing what we need doing to them to do, we may just need to do it ourselves. And this is why I'm intrigued by all these crown corporations that C.D. Howe created, right? And, and part of why I fixate on that is because in the absence of creating new crown enterprises, the best we can do is try to incentivize somebody else to do what needs doing instead of doing it ourselves. Again, fascinating parallel with the pandemic, right? The federal government response has been really good on a lot of levels. But one thing they didn't do a year ago is bring back a, a crown corporation to mass produce vaccines. And, and, in the, and because of that, we are completely reliant on imports from others, um, instead of just having the capacity to do it ourselves. So there's a huge role for the private sector, but I, but I, would, you know, I would point out that what, what I appreciated about the business leaders of the World War II era is that as much as they were contributing they were clear that when you need to accomplish something at speed and scale, as we do again today, it has to be state-led. Okay. Wow, thank you for that answer. I, sometimes I get so lost because it's about history and, and trying to follow all of that. And I feel like I'm still learning so much as I go. So it's so helpful to hear your answers and get that new perspective. It's a fun to dive into this. And I, have to, I found it fun, by the way. And, uh, and diving into it made me think differently about emergencies. Um, I'm also a former socialist teacher in a high school. So it, it, I like the idea that the book might make the study of World War II newly relevant to a, 
generation of young people. And I love that too. I would really love to um, read this book because from what I've heard from Kim, who is so avid about this, as soon as she heard about this book, she read it immediately and decided to hold this event. Um, and I have it on hold at the library. So I'm very excited to deep dive into it and continue learning about the climate crisis and what we can be doing. Um, the next question that I have for you, just because there's so many, um, how can we have a long-term plan while most politicians just plan for the next four years? Even if the current government plans something more ambitious, what if the next government um, does not agree on the existence of climate change? Well, you know, it is true that one of the challenges we face, one of the, the really the curse of climate relative to COVID or relative to the war is that it moves in slow motion. And, and, and it becomes easy for political leaders to kick the can down the road, especially when they're looking at four-year terms. Um, we have to crack that dynamic. We have to elect more climate champions, real climate champions who are in it to win it. Squads of such champions across a number of political parties and who are prepared to use their political muscle to demand a real emergency plan at the federal level, at the provincial level, at the municipal level. They're out there. Those climate champions are there who are in it to win it. Um, and if I may, you know, I'm a little biased in this, but um, so my wife's a, a, a Vancouver municipal councillor named Christine Boyle, who is the councillor who introduced the climate emergency motion in Vancouver. Um, and, uh, and the outcome of that, it's not merely a symbolic motion. Vancouver has now the most ambitious climate emergency municipal plan in North America, one of, if not the most. The, and, and they're hitting the four markers. So for just to give you one example, in Vancouver, no new buildings will be able to tie into natural gas for space and water heating as of next year, right? Uh, so that's what I mean by, that's marker three big time. Um, but interestingly, here's the point of my sharing this story when you ask, how do we achieve this? Um, the Vancouver, Vancouver City Council uh, is politically all over the map. No, no, no political group has a majority. Um, my wife is all alone in her political party. Um, you never know how this gang is going to vote on anything. But interestingly, those climate emergency motions passed unanimously across the political spectrum. Now, how did that happen? Part of it is that my wife's really good at her job. But if you, would, if you ask her why it happened, she would say it happened because dozens of young people, particularly high school students, skipped school each time that one of those votes was happening. They rallied outside, they spoke before council, they filled the galleries, they watched the votes, and they basically made it politically impossible for even the more conservative councillors to vote no. They accomplished something amazing and set an interesting example for other municipalities and provinces to say, this doesn't need to be the partisan wedge issue it often is. Um, they did something amazing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's definitely an issue that goes across political divides. We have to unite for this one issue to further it, right? Um, and it's interesting you brought up the youth and how they are really taking hold of this, this crisis and furthering the agenda and calling attention to it. And I'm curious, what you think about this movement and how the older generations can start to take part and you know help I, youth fight this um issue yeah sorry go ahead. well they're leading it i feel so great so such gratitude for the for the youth climate strike movement um i mean it's it's a, i think it's important for us to remember because we've all kind of forgotten through this 12 months of pandemic that momentum was really building before that. And a year and a half ago, these student-led strikes uh, got a, basically a million Canadians on the street uh, in the largest single day of protest in Canadian history. Um, so I feel tremendous gratitude. How should we help them? Well, first of all, we should just let them lead. Secondly, we should let them serve. So one of the ideas in the book is I think we should have a, a youth climate core something really big. I don't mean like some, you know, youth employment program that, 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 you know, creates spaces for a few dozen young people. 
I'm talking thousands, just like the army has people out of high school and gives them gives them room and board and a, and a stipend to, to serve and, and then pays for their post-secondary education. Let's do that on a mass scale. Because if I were a young person today, you know, facing this climate emergency moment, mm -hmm. I don't even know that I'd want to go straight into university. I'm, apologies to any, any parents out there who are trying to get their, their children to enroll, but like the emergency is now. Why are we asking these young people to defer when the emergency is now, let them serve. And the third thing I would say is give them the vote. Um, like, here's an interesting parallel out of the wartime story. I said earlier over a million Canadians enlisted, 70% of them were under the age of 21. You know what that means? It means that they, they, they heeded the call to enlist and, and thousands of them died, but you know what they couldn't do? They couldn't vote. The federal voting age was 21 until 1970. And there's this fascinating parallel now where the very people who will most have to live with the consequences of our inaction are denied the franchise. Mm -hmm. But I think we should give it to them. I love that. Um, so last two questions, because I know at hard six you have to go. Um, can we accomplish these things by working at a local slash municipal level, at least as a way to mobilize the federal government? Well, I've already sort of preempted that question a little bit by sharing the Vancouver story. And I do think that that municipal action is really helpful. Um, but I would say, you know, dozens of cities now across Canada have passed these climate emergency motions. The, the truth is most of them are symbolic. They're not meaty like the Vancouver one is. And so what I would say to everyone is use the four markers because the four markers are, are a litmus test of getting emergency that you can apply to a federal government, any federal political party platform, any provincial party platform, any municipal climate plan. In fact, the plans of any large institution, or a university or what have you, you can use the four markers to say, to, to, a, to as a litmus test to assess whether or not this body is actually in emergency mode. Mm -hmm. um, but it does matter to have municipal governments uh, uh, passing motions saying to provincial and federal governments, we're in emergency mode and we need you there too. Particularly the federal and provincial governments because if you look at what's happened, you know, I showed you that flat line, right, of our emissions here. But here's the thing, if you just looked at municipal emissions, they've actually been trending down. The problem is that the expansion of the oil sands in particular and natural in, in fracking it's on the production side of fossil fuels that the emissions have so gone up that they've undone all that good work at the municipal level. And so we need municipal governments to say that provincial and federal governments, hey, we're doing what you're saying, what you're asking for. We're, we're, don't undo our good work. Um, we all have to do this. I love how passionate you are about this. It's so amazing to hear. Um... So one more question. Um, can you comment on the Treasury Board's carbon budget and the application of their work? Yeah, well, uh, we don't have a carbon budget yet. I would dearly love to have one. Um, uh, and, and so I think, you know, if we were, this comes back to the amendments that need to happen with C12. I would love to see C12 include rolling carbon budgets. And, and I would say to the liberals out there, you did a great thing creating three-year rolling fiscal budgets. You know, every year they present a budget that's basically a three-year budget. And it allows everyone to plan knowing three years ahead, here's, here's the budget we have to work with. We need that on rolling three-year budgets for carbon where every sector and province can know, here's the maximum we have to work within and make our plans accordingly. And we can have a, a federal carbon budget officer just like we have a federal parliamentary budget officer Mm -hmm. to, to oversee that and ensure that the, that the, that the budgets are being adhered to. Um, but it's, it's innovations like that, I think, that will keep us on track so that we don't follow in this history of, uh, of setting targets that we don't meet. Uh, right. That's what we need to change. Maybe if you don't mind, can I, can I offer a final thought before, we, before I leave? Of course. Um, you know, 
I think I, I've been giving talks like this a lot over the last few months, and and people often say, you know, look look at the issue of COVID fatigue. You know, people in less than a year, people are really tired of being in emergency mode, and here 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 I am telling people get back into emergency mode for a few years. Can they really do that? Um, the COVID fatigue is real, uh, but there there is an important distinction I want to make. The things that we have been called upon to do in this pandemic are anathema to all of our social instincts, to isolate, to stay home, and that's hard. The good news is that the things we are called upon to do in response to the climate emergency are precisely the opposite, to get out there and do something grand together. And we can do that for a good number of years. Um, I'm happy to, uh, to share that I, I'm planning on spending the next few years just trying to animate these ideas. So, so I'm launching this new climate emergency unit with the David Suzuki Institute, as you heard. Um, our website isn't up and running yet, but it will be in a couple of weeks. And I'm, I'm, and I'm hoping the, the folks at Sustainable Milton will uh, share a notice about that once it's out, I'll make sure it finds its way to you. But um, uh, let me offer this final thought. Like many of you, because you're on this call, um, as you read the latest scientific warnings, we're afraid, right? And a lot of us feel deep anxiety about the state of the world we're leaving our kids and, and grandkids. All of us who take seriously these scientific realities wrestle with despair. That is the ambiguous time in which we live. The truth is we don't know if we're gonna win this fight and if we will do what we have to do in time. But consider this, you heard me say out of 11 million Canadians in World War II, over a million of them enlisted. It's a remarkable figure. I mean, that is, that's mobilization, eh? But you know what they didn't know? They didn't know if they would win. Um, we often forget that there was a good chunk of the war's early years when the outcome was far from certain. We know how the story ended, but they didn't. And yet that generation rallied regardless. And in the process, they surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving, not only on the battlefront, but on the complete transformation of the home front and social relations. That's the spirit that we need today. I Thanks agree. everyone. Thank you for such inspiring words. I'm sure everyone is very grateful to have listened to you for the last, um, you know, for this whole webinar. So thank you so much for joining us and answering everyone's questions. I know there was so many that we weren't able to uh, get to unfortunately, but I do know that Seth has to um, hop off now, right? Um, so thank you again, and um, we hope to see more about the movement that you're creating. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your interest. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. All right, everyone. So it was so great to have you here. Um, we will be closing up shortly. I did want to just... Uh, go through a short toolkit walkthrough, which we'll, we will be sharing um, later this week. So it will be covering a couple different things, um, which they're just pulling up right now, um, some easy actions that you can do. And in this toolkit, there we go, yes. So first and foremost, these are the four actions that Sustainable Milton thinks that you should take after this webinar, which is to share on social media that you attended this webinar. Please let us know what you learned, how you feel. Are you enthusiastic, passionate? Are you, you know, ready to take action for climate change? Um, and have a conversation with three friends, five friends, 10 friends, just to pass on the message. I know definitely I will be speaking to my close social bubble about what I've learned today, because we're all just trying to aspire to be better and just to continue this great movement and to enact change, because that's all we are trying to do, right? That's why we're all here today, to really, you know, change the world. Um, next is to connect with organizations, um, promoting the strengthening of C12. So. A lot of the things that are covered in the toolkit that we'll be sharing with you um, do highlight a great organizations that you should follow and all the work that they're doing. And call your MP, have a discussion with them, um, hear their thoughts on 
Bill C-12 and see what they can be, do, uh, be doing to support it. So just uh, check your inbox. It should be coming in the next week with the toolkit. And I hope to see all of you, uh, all of you soon, because I know every single person on this call is fighting the good fight. And I really hope that I get to meet all of you in person one day, whether it's through a rally or through social media or through another webinar where I can actually see your faces. Um, but it was so great to be here today to help moderate um, this great webinar. And I'm gonna pass it off to Marcia now. Thank you so much, Efreen. This is a great toolkit that you've put together for us and we really appreciate it. You did an amazing job tonight. So thank you so much for moderating this event this evening. Um, I'd like to take a minute and thank some of our promotional partners. So GAS, I see Michelle Tom is here tonight. Thank you so much. Um, Climate Reality Canada for helping with our promotion, CFUW Milton. And there were so many other contributors to our network that we are so grateful for um, helping us and promoting this event to making it a success. Um, I'd also like to thank, take a minute and thank our crew at Sustainable Milton. You've seen a few of us tonight, but there are so many others behind the scenes, um, volunteers, um, a few that come to mind. Um, I wanna take a chance to, to uh, thank our new member, Mary Brown. Um, who rolled up her sleeves and jumped in like this was her first event and she just recently joined us and didn't shy away from like this huge challenge so thank you so much and we have an amazing set of volunteers and we hope that every municipality can have such an amazing group of dedicated volunteers to work with it's been a pleasure um we hope you enjoyed the event tonight and we look forward to seeing you again in the future um, please check out our website and look for future webinars to come to you. And uh, and we look forward to hearing from everyone. You look out for your, your toolkit, which will be coming soon. And just quickly thanking all of the other organizations who currently have campaigns that are doing campaigns on C12 and have done such amazing research into this legislation. So I know there are many more, but these are a few that we've that we've looked at. Thank you very much. And good night.